and amen. It's good to be with you this morning. I would ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to read that passage for us this morning in your hearing while you read along in your Bibles. And we will uh, we'll consider this beautiful text together this morning. Remember, this is not man talking to us. This is God speaking to us. And we would ask him to speak loudly because we are hard of hearing, aren't we? And we often are dull and senseless. And may he enliven us for this time to hear his word read and then to hear it preached. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, God says this, And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at the king's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem. For he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God abides forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And let's pray together. Oh, Lord God, as I've already said, we are a weak and needy people, and we come begging for your mercy and grace during these next few moments that we might hear your voice loud and clear, that you might cause our hearts to be lifted up, our minds to be renewed, that none of us would leave this place as we came, but that we'd all leave with the Lord Jesus Christ clearly before us. And so we ask you to lead on, O King Eternal, in this place this morning, that all glory, laud, and honor might be yours. 
and we'll give you the praise for it. In the name of your Son, here in the presence of your Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Well, we've been talking about Reformation things this weekend. Last, uh, uh, last or yesterday, rather, we, we considered Martin Luther and some of his contributions that abide and are important. We considered John Calvin. We looked at the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. And, uh, and so, as uh, I was asked uh, by pastor to preach on perhaps some of the great doctrines of the Reformation, I thought, well, why just pick one? He suggested justification, and I've been preaching through the book of Romans in our church at Covenant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. But uh, I thought, well, you know, why just preach on justification when I can preach on sin? As Barney Fife said to the parson at Mayberry one Sunday after he'd slept through a sermon and the preacher had preached on the love of God, he said, well, you never get enough of sin. Well, we're going to preach about sin this morning. We're going to really preach about sin. We're going to preach about the uh, remedy for sin, justification. We're going to preach about another part of the wonderful remedy of our sin, and that's our adoption as sons of God. And, and then we're going to talk a little bit about sanctification too. It's all here in this beautiful passage. Uh, history, especially biblical history. Uh, as I was preaching through the book of Ruth a couple of years ago, I was just reminded over and over, and I said to our folks over and over, history teaches us theology. History is God's unveiling of theology in these beautiful stories. Uh, it'd be easy for us to read this story and say, wow, what a beautiful story, and just pass over it and miss all the details, all the colors. And let's not do that this morning. Let's uh, be reminded of God's wonderful truths to us this morning. Well, you, you see the title. A pastor actually changed it a little bit. He changed it to the grace. Grace, what is it? Grace to the dog. Uh, the title originally was the Reformation of a Dog. Uh, with Luther, uh, Leo X in his, uh, in his bull, uh, which is this lengthy paper that he wrote against Luther and the Reformers, uh, he referred to Luther as that wild boar in the forest. Wild boar. Children, that's a, that's a feral pig or a wild pig, okay? Uh, that means he's out of control. He's tearing up everything, uh, rooting up the crops that we have out there that are bearing us fruit to pay our, our beautiful buildings and big salaries. This wild boar is running loose in the forest. Well... We don't have a boar in this passage, but we have a dog, a self-described dog, Mephibosheth. He considered himself that. that. Did you see that as we read it? He described himself as not just a dog, by the way, a dead dog. But we see God come into his life here and reform him in this beautiful imagery of King David coming, the man after God's own heart. So just as David here is a man after God's own heart, we saw yesterday Luther, Calvin, and others of the Reformation, they were men after God's own heart because they were men of the book. They found God set before them in these pages. What does our catechism teach us? What does the Bible principally teach? The Bible principally teaches us two things, right? What we're supposed to believe about God, know about God, and what God requires of us. What duties He requires. This passage is about David knowing God and Mephibosheth coming to know the love of God, the kindness of God. As I've already said, the doctrines of sin, doctrines of justification, adoption, sanctification are all there. This reformation of this dead dog, I hope it's your story. I hope you can look at yourself and say, that, that's who I was. We read in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're all dead in trespasses and sins. I hope you have come to that point. If you haven't this morning, I hope you come to that point to realize that you're worthless without Christ. And with Christ, you're of an infinite worth. 
bought with a price. You're a, tri a prized possession and a, and a beautiful trophy. So let's look at God's grace at work here in this passage. Because this passage is about God's grace at work reforming and changing a man. Not only in his position to the king, but also in his livelihood. In his whole life, he's transformed. So let's look at this. I'm going to do it under three heads. If we were at Covenant, I'd, you'd have an outline in your, in your bulletin. But uh, listen, I'll give it to you. First, the story of a covenant is unfolded here for us. The story of a covenant is unfolded. If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 20, you'll read about David and Jonathan, his dear friend, his, his, his closest friend, entering into this covenant. They bound themselves with a solemn oath of life and death with stipulations and promises. And there in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, you see the suffering that's going to take place and be part of this covenant keeping process. Let's never forget that the covenant, as Palmer Robertson reminded us many, many years ago and many have followed, it's, 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 it's marked out in blood. It's a blood covenant oath. It's a blood covenant. Hebrews 13 20 tells us that the blood of the eternal covenant is our hope in that beautiful benediction. Listen what Jonathan and David do here. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord saying the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. You'll find that in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, verse 42. You'll find there, if we have time to, to search it out, you'd have all the elements of a covenant there. So they cut a covenant with one another. And they promised that it would be good for them and for their offspring to come. This covenant's patterned after that which God swore to his own people. And this is exemplified for us in Genesis chapter 15. Go back and read that this afternoon and you'll see there the cutting of the covenant. And God swearing to his people that if, if I fail, Abraham, to keep my covenant, my word, my promise with you, may I perish just as these sacrifices have perished. But here's the thing. God can't perish, can he? He's eternal, unchanging, infinite. He was making a statement there in that imagery of Genesis 15 that his words were sure, that he would be God to Abraham and Abraham would be his man and his children children, children. It shouldn't surprise us to see that David, a man after God's own heart and the great type of King Jesus, would make a covenant and keep a covenant. Calvin called the covenant process that of binding of God, the binding of God. Listen, folks, you and I, and I know you've seen on television false prophets, false preachers, false apostles claiming to have bound God to do things for them. You and I cannot bind God, but God can bind himself. Children, children's catechism, what can God do? God can do all his holy will. Adults, it'd be good for us to go back and refresh on the children's catechism from time to time. God can do all his holy will. And God from eternity bound himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to do for a needy people, a sinful fallen people, and for this world that he created. Now let me ask you a question. If God bound himself to do something, will he not accomplish it? Certainly he will. He will do all his holy will. And he accomplishes it. David here typifies 
our great God. And he's doing it according to verse 15 of chapter 8, administering justice and equity to all his people. This is part of his, his program. David's program was to administer justice and equity. And how did he do it? By keeping his covenant with Jonathan in this case. God keeps his covenant with his people. Every time, children, every time one of you is baptized into this church, God's keeping covenant. That his people and their children will be part of his church. And every time you profess your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, call upon him and ask him to save you from your sins, God's being faithful to his covenant. It's all about God's faithfulness. There's no hope for us without God. And there's no hope for us without God's covenant faithfulness. And David's exemplifying it here in this passage. He's keeping covenant. You say, well, how do you know this is about covenant keeping? Yeah, you've read us 1 Samuel chapter 20, and that's about a covenant. I can see that. I've been around Reformed Church long enough to see covenant all over. 1 Samuel 20, 42. How do you know it's here? Well, you read it. I'll just remind you, verse 1. So that I may show him kindness. That's that chesed word that we like to say. That Hebrew word that none of us with tongues over here on this side of the world can quite get out of our throats. But chesed, it's translated variously in the ESV, kindness, in the New American Standard, kindness, some translated as the loving kindness, steadfast love sometimes as the translation. But it's God's covenant faithfulness. How do you know this is supposed to exemplify God's covenant toward man? Well, David tells us so. In verse 3, he says, And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God? Not just David's kindness, but the kindness of God. And then again, in verse 7, do not fear. Why? Why? Why should I not fear? And you're going to see in a moment, Mephibosheth had good reason to be afraid. No doubt, when he fell off the litter, bowing before King David, he was trembling. And David saw it. And he declares, do not fear. But why? Here's why. For I will show you kindness. And notice it's not kindness for what you are, Mephibosheth. It's not kindness because you let them put you on the litter and bring you over here from Lodabar. It's kindness for someone else's sake. You and I are who we are in Christ Jesus not for any good in us, but because of the grace of God and the infinite work of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. This is a great passage. It's about the covenant faithfulness of God towards sinners. Mephibosheth, a dead dog. Martin Luther, a wild boar. You can describe yourself any way you like as long as you use... Some kind of biblical terminology. King David described himself as a worm. Worms are kind of sticky and slimy. The point is there's none righteous and none deserve God's goodness and God's grace and God's mercy ever. This is a story of covenant. Now, who's the object of the covenant? Well, in this case, the object of the covenant is, is Jonathan. Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. Remember, historically and politically, the context here. This is, a, this is an age where, where bloodbaths would occur in the transition of power from one king to another king. And remember, too, David's not a descendant of Saul. Normally, the, the descendant of Saul, one of the descendants of the king, would have been the next king, right? Uh, well, Jonathan's not alive. 
Mephibosheth is. Mephibosheth had a right to the throne, legally, politically. In other words, he's a threat to the throne. When you read passages in the Bible even, there are those times where, where people are taken out because they were threats to the throne. And that still goes on around the world, by the way. It's not just unique to 1000 B.C. It still happens right now. A dear friend of mine who's a, a translator of God's Holy Word in Kenya, you know, they're awaiting, they've just had their recent, most recent elections overthrown, and they're awaiting elections to come sometime, hopefully this month. And he continues pelting us with emails, pray, pray. You don't understand, this is not the United States of America where transition takes place peacefully and without bloodletting. This, 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 this thing could be really bad. People could die. Our city, Karen, is in, in, in great threat right now of riots and, and civil unrest. This still goes on. The point here is not the political and historical so much, but just this simple point. Mephibosheth was an enemy of the king. By his mere existence, he was an enemy. Folks, listen, that's the way you and I are described in the scriptures. We are at enmity with God. We are aliens now, some of you are sitting here, hopefully everyone in this room sitting here, you've trusted Christ, you've tasted and seen that He is good. And you say, I'm not an enemy anymore. And there's some might be sitting here and you've never tasted of the grace of God and you know nothing of the mercies of Jesus Christ. You've not trusted Him for the forgiveness of your sins. But you might be thinking, I don't, I don't hate God, I'm not an enemy. I've got nothing against God. Yes, you are. If you're not a friend, if you're not a lover, if you're not a truster in the Lord God Almighty, you're an enemy. You're either for him or against him, King Jesus said. The good news is you can move from the enemy side to the friend side today through this grace that's in Christ Jesus. So Mephibosheth was an enemy. He needed somebody to take care of this problem he had. Notice too, he was a cripple. Verse 3. Isn't it interesting how Ziba describes them? There is a son left. He's Mephibosheth. He's a cripple in both feet. In other words, he's useless. No good. You don't need to waste your time on him. Folks, I want to ask you something. I'm afraid sometimes we think that way toward our lost neighbor and our lost colleague at work, our lost friends at school. Oh, you know, golly, he's worthless. He's of no worth, no count. Don't want him around church. He'd be a troublemaker. God saves cripples. God saves worthless people. In fact, that's the only people he saves because we're all worthless. We're all cripples. But Ziba had a common mentality, didn't he? That's how he thought about Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth described himself as a slave. I'm a slave. But even more vividly, he described himself as a dog, but not any old dog, a dead dog. You say, boy, this guy had a self-esteem problem. I would submit to you that Mephibosheth had a realistic view of himself. That we see here in Mephibosheth's description of himself... Some evidence that, that the movement of David toward him 
this covenant faithfulness toward Mephibosheth was causing Mephibosheth to see himself for who he really was. See, it was easy over on the Transjordan side in Lodabar, over in Manasseh. It was easy to just carry on. But when you're face to face with the king, you see yourself differently. And that's what happens with us. Jesus said to Nicodemus, didn't he, that unless, unless the spirit from above reworks your heart, unless you're given the new birth by the spirit, you can't see the kingdom. In other words, you don't see things rightly. And then he says, you certainly can't enter into the kingdom unless you're born from above. Unless there's this encounter with the great God of heaven, we see ourselves wrongly. We don't see ourselves the way we should. Now Mephibosheth is seeing himself a servant, a slave, a cripple, a dead dog. He's worthless. So let me ask you something. Do you see yourself in this same imagery? We're unworthy to be recipients of God's grace. We're unworthy of his covenant faithfulness. But he bound himself to reach out to us. He bound himself to bring us to himself. He bound himself to speak words of forgiveness to us. He bound himself to save us in our totality. Isn't that wonderful? The grace of God. The covenant is for enemies, the covenant's for slaves, the covenant's for dead dogs, the covenant's for wild boars. Doesn't matter how you see yourself, describe yourself as a sinner, the covenant of grace is our hope. Now let's look at the benefits to this, this object of grace. First is, did you notice he's lame, he's crippled in his feet, and so David doesn't say, okay, somebody... Go tell Mephibosheth to get on over here. Did you notice that? No. What he said was this. If you go back and, and read it, it says, Then David, verse 5, sent and brought him. Don't read over that too lightly. David sent and brought him. Folks, listen, if you've come to Christ in saving faith, it's because the Spirit of the living God came and got you. God the Father sent him to bring you to Jesus. You didn't walk the aisle to Jesus. You didn't raise your hand to Jesus. You didn't pray a prayer to Jesus. To get yourself there. The Spirit of God changed your heart, made you willing, made you a believer, gave you those treasures of faith and repentance that you might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He brought you. There's none of this business with God. Okay, here it is. Reach up here and get it. No. King David sent and brought him. Now remember, he's crippling both feet. You got the imagery in that culture, probably they went over after they brought him uh, on some sort of mechanism to Jerusalem. They would, then would have placed him on a litter, you know, like a, 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 a cot sort of thing, a stretcher. And uh, four men would have, would have put him on their shoulders and brought him in on the litter. They set him on the floor. And there in that, in that position, he falls over on his face. Because he knew he wasn't worthy. Pastor Al Martin, many years ago, wrote a little booklet called The Implications of Calvinism. Banner of Truth keeps it in print. One of the things Pastor Martin said in there is that uh, Calvinism does not produce proud people. Calvinism, rightly understood, rightly received, produces humility. It produces a humble person. 
it produces a person like Mephibosheth here who falls on his face before the king. You notice Mephibosheth doesn't say, now, before you say a word, David, I'm Jonathan's son. I should be here. I'm the rightful heir. He doesn't do that, does he? He falls on his face. And same way, I hear people sometimes, you know, I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven. No, you won't. We'll be so overwhelmed by the glory of the triune God. We won't be wagging our fingers. We won't be blaming God. Why is this person not here? Why is that person not here? We'll just be praising our great God for his glory. Mephibosheth falls out and pays homage to David. There's the go get him. That's the external call if you want to talk theology here. And then there's the he brought him there. That's the, that internal, the effectual call that's at work on Mephibosheth. And then notice, as I said, the humility that's produced here. But then notice what David says. After Mephibosheth starts with, I'm a slave, David said, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Do not fear. That's where I want you to focus. This is the doctrine of reconciliation which is all part of the doctrine of justification. He didn't deserve it. David simply declares it. He reckons it so, to use old King James language from Romans 3 and 4. He reckoned it. He declared it. Not guilty. You have no reason to be afraid. You're not guilty. You're no longer an enemy. The Prince of Peace has settled this for you. And that's our story if we're in Christ. The Prince of Peace, King Jesus, has settled our, our enmity problem. He's come between God the Father and us and made peace so that we don't have to fear. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do not fear. Your sins have been washed as white as snow. I remember the first time seeing a little girl's eyes who had never seen snow before. Dear friends, Alonzo Ramirez from Peru. They were in our home just four or five years ago, five, five years ago now. And little Anna, we took her in the winter time, January, we took her to the chimney tops in the Great Smoky Mountains. And there was snow. She was fascinated. And you know what she said? This is what it means. What? They were throwing snowballs at one another. White as snow. This is what it means. To be washed white as snow. Clean. There's nothing that clean and pretty in Peru, I'll tell you. She'd never seen anything that clean and pretty. Legal declaration, do not fear. But there's more than that. And there's always more than that. You've not only been declared not guilty, you've not been acquitted, you've not been justified alone, but the high king, the judge of the earth and the whole universe, steps down from around the justice bar and he does something that you've never seen a judge do in your life, most likely. I've watched Perry Mason reruns. I've watched Matlock straight out of Atlanta, Georgia, according to the television series. And I've seen the judge wrap his hammer and say, I find you not guilty. But I'll tell you something I've never seen. I've never seen that judge on TV, and I've been in the courtroom a few times. I've never seen a judge then step down 
come down, put his arm around that person who's been charged with some crime. He's perhaps lost his family, perhaps lost his job. Now he has stigma attached to his reputation. Maybe hard to find a job. He has nothing. And the judge steps down and puts his arm around him and says, you're going home with me. And you're going to eat at my table always. You'll never have any more concerns. I'm going to put servants out there to till the ground and to serve you and produce from the land what you need. But did you notice that? He told Ziba, I'm going to give him all of Saul's properties and you're going to go out and you're going to take care of it and you're going to produce good stuff off of it. But then there's that but. But Mephibosheth doesn't need it because he's going to eat at my table forever. It's remarkable, isn't it? Folks, listen. Whatever you think you need on this earth, you don't really, and I don't really. But the one thing we do need is Jesus. And if we have Christ, we have everything we need. Is that not what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians? That he is our everything in verse 30 and 31. Therefore, we should boast in the Lord and not in man. He adopted him. Did you see down there? He says, and so... After he's told him, you're going to eat at my table in verse 7. And then he told him again, you're going to eat at my table always in verse, verse 10. And then in, again in, in verse 11, he says, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table. And this time we have that little add-on, like one of the king's sons. We're royalty, folks. If you are saved, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're royalty. We're royal priesthood, we saw yesterday, one of Luther's emphases. But notice finally, we're not just justified and we're not just declared sons, but there's something else that's going on here. You notice what it says? You're going to eat at my table always. But then we're left with this, this strange, seemingly almost chilling last comment. Mephibosheth was lame in both his feet. Listen, folks. Although he had been declared not guilty, at peace with the king, and adopted as a son, he still couldn't do for himself. He was still in need of the grace of King David. And so every meal... Every snack time, every feast, the king would send and have him brought to the table. I think that's a, a vague image at least of the doctrine of sanctification. We're in continuing need. Our nourishment to be sustained, we depend on our Savior. Not just for our justification, not just for our adoption as sons, but for our sanctification. Every time you come to the Lord's table, remember that. You're coming because He's bringing you here. You're coming because He wants to feed you and needs to feed you and nourish you in your soul. And if you're coming to this table, it's not for any good in you, but because of the grace of God poured out richly to dead dogs and to wild boars and to worms. That's Mephibosheth's story. The grace of God, the reformation of a dead dog. I hope it's your story. If it's not, you need to fall out before the king this morning and he'll be merciful to you. Call upon his name. And you'll not only be declared not guilty and no longer have to live in fear of eternal wrath of God, but you'll be one of his sons and daughters. And he'll take care of you forever. The old saint, Polycarp, refused to recant. Six and eighty years he has been kind to me. How could I deny my Savior now? It doesn't matter how long you live, he'll be kind to you because his covenant 
is certain. Amen. Father, thank you for your word, for this passage, and we ask you to bless it now to your glory and to our good in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.